he got a bigger taste of just how bad his hometown was when he got confronted by three men while walking home after practice. He stood tall, ready to defend himself, until one of them put a gun to his forehead. So this is where part one ended off, on Damian Lillard's Against All Odds story. If you haven't seen it, click the first link in the description to watch it first. But to carry on with his story, he ended up giving up his wallet and luckily the three guys let him go. But this just goes to show the kind of area he grew up in and why he fears nothing today. Back on the court though, even though he made it to a division 1 school like he wanted, he only finished high school as a 2 star recruit. So when he got to Weber State, Damian Lillard took that work ethic and by the end of his 4 years there, he went from a 2 star recruit to averaging 24, 5, and 4 and being known as the top point guard prospect in the 2012 NBA draft proving everyone wrong who ever doubted him when he finally made it to the league against all odds. And even though he's finally made it, he still carries that mindset with him today when he doesn't make an all-star team, an all-NBA team, or is thought of as an underdog in the playoffs. Number 6, John Wall. In my opinion, Wall has the most moving story in the NBA. And here's why. Because just three weeks after his first birthday, his father robbed a convenience store, and because of that and his previous run-ins with the law, he was forced to serve the next seven years in jail. Within that time, the Wall family would make the two-hour drive every single weekend to visit him. And on one of those visits, John's dad sat him down and had a long talk to him about how he needed to be a better person than he was, and how he had to take care of his family and his mother like a real man. Something his dad wasn't ever able to do. And then one day when John Wall was eight, his father was finally released from prison and almost right away the family packed up the car and went out to a cabin for a family vacation and it was the first time in John's life that he got to spend time with his dad with no restrictions from prison guards he said it was some of the best days of his life but on the last day of the trip his father got sick and they learned that he was only released from prison because he was terminally ill with liver cancer and the time they spent in the water on that trip infected his wounds so his dad was rushed to the hospital and the rest of the family was rushed home. And then a few days later, John overheard his mom on the phone say that his dad passed away. So he ran outside and cried for hours. But just to make things worse, at the funeral, his older brother promised to step up and take care of the family. But just a year later, he got locked up for the next nearly 20 years. And this is when John's attitude and his life really changed. Because even though he would show signs of becoming a phenomenal athlete and a basketball player, he was known as a bad kid and a criminal by everyone he knew. He'd cuss out his teammates, steal cars, break windows, and get in a lot of trouble for the rest of his teenage years. And even by the time he'd make it to high school, on the court he'd yell at teammates who didn't pass him the ball, or coaches that tried to tell him what to do. And when they would refuse to play him, he'd sit on the end of the bench and eat snacks while the rest of the game went on. And this attitude led to him getting kicked out of a lot of camps, and coaches trying to tell him the hard truth, that he should be getting recruited by big colleges like Duke and North Carolina, but that was never going to happen with his attitude. And as the years went on, there would be certain instances where a coach would actually make a small difference in his attitude. But nothing changes his life more than when his mother spent her last $200 she had for him to go to an AAU tournament and let her electricity get shut off for the next two days. John said, if my mom was going to do that for me, I was going to do everything I could to give her a better life. Which really changed his outlook on life and led to him working harder than ever before and quickly rising up the ranks to being the number one high school basketball player in America. He then went on to go play one year at Kentucky before going first overall in the 2010 NBA draft. And then right after that he bought his mom a 7 bedroom house and in an open letter to ESPN told his dad, Dad I know you're proud of the man I've become. We never had the opportunity to interact like a father and son should, but I've taken care of my mom and the family just like you told me. He went on to write that when he becomes a father, he's going to share his dad's story with his children and let them know that every generation can be better than the last and that he's living proof of that. And John had his first child in December of 2018, so this is a story that his kid's gonna be hearing in a few years too. Number 7, Jeremy Lin. The Lin Sanity story will always be one of the best stories of a player being made overnight by making the most out of the opportunity they were given. And here's how it started. Lin's parents started out living in Taiwan before he was born. And the two main reasons that his father wanted to move to America were to finish his PhD and to watch more NBA basketball. And by the time that he moved here, he had never played the game, but eventually studied players and taught himself, and eventually taught Jeremy Lin once he was born. And he ended up doing a great job because he was a standout in high school, but he felt that he never got the respect he deserves because of his race. 
which led to him not getting a single D1 scholarship offer. Except for one that he got from Harvard, who let him play but didn't give him a scholarship. And he played great there, putting up 17 a game on great shooting numbers and over 2 steals a game his last 2 years there, but went undrafted in the 2010 NBA draft. Lin said that the pre-draft workouts were never 5 on 5, and they were all either 1 on 1, 2 on 2, or 3 on 3. And he said that he had never played basketball like that before, which is why he felt that things went so bad for him. Scouts that were there even went on to say that he's a smart passer, but had a flawed jump shot and a thin frame, might not have the strength and athleticism to defend, create his own shot or finish at the rim in the NBA. But the man would still go on to have an impressive performance in the NBA Summer League, and end up getting a 2 year offer from his hometown Warriors team. Team. And this made him the first American born Chinese player, which led to him getting similar attention to what Yao Ming got, but on a smaller scale. He would have groups of fans at home and away games cheer him every night and every time he stepped on the floor. He would have people always looking to make documentaries of his story, and would get as many interview requests as Steph Curry. But he never let this get to him, because then Warriors coach Keith Smart said that Lin always arrived to practice early and left late, and would spend all of his free time studying Steve Nash, because he said, neither of us are freak athletes, but we're both effective and know how to play the game. Now this work ethic that he has didn't make a difference right away, because on the Warriors he only played 29 games and averaged 2 points a game before eventually getting waived at the start of next season when Mark Jackson took over as head coach. But in that offseason, he trained harder than ever before, using the criticism that those pre-draft scouts gave him as motivation, and changed his jump shot that he had used since the 8th grade, got stronger by almost doubling the amount he could squat, tripling the amount of pull-ups he could do, gaining 15 pounds of muscle, and raising his vertical by 3.5 inches. And then on December 27th, when Iman Shumpert went out for the Knicks due to injury, Jeremy Lin was was claimed off of waivers by the Knicks, and Lin's sanity began. Number 8, Caleb Swanigan. Swanigan isn't too known across the league, but he's definitely battled a lot to get there. And it started when he was born while his dad was addicted to drugs and his mother had six children. His father's side of the family had always battled with obesity, and to show how serious it actually is, his father passed away in 2014 from complications with diabetes, and at the time he passed, he was 6 foot 8 and close to 500 pounds. And it's turned out to be something Caleb's had to deal with since he was a kid, because by the 8th grade he was 6 foot 2 and 360 pounds. And you might think it would be easy for him to just go on a diet, but since his family was so poor, they usually couldn't afford it. In fact, they were so poor that by the time he was 13, Caleb Swanigan had lived in 5 different homeless shelters and gone to 13 different schools. And it was around this time that Caleb's older brother basically saved his life by getting him into basketball, when he called his former AAU coach to get him on the team. And not only did Roosevelt Barnes let him play, he adopted him and raised him as his own son, and providing him better food to get his weight down. And through the help of his new guardian, he became an elite high school player, becoming a top 20 national prospect, putting up 22 and 13, and even graduated a year early because he did so good academically. And by the time that he graduated, he had grown to 6 foot 8, but managed to bring his weight all the way down to 260 pounds. He would go on to go to Purdue, and break out in his sophomore season which led to him entering the NBA draft the next year, where he was picked up 26 overall by the Portland Trailblazers. At first, it really looked like Swanigan was on a path that would have made him end up like his father, but ever since Roosevelt Barnes adopted him, he's never really struggled with his weight that bad again, and has turned his life around to making it into the NBA. Number 9, Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade was born in a bad part of Chicago. But to make it even worse, he was born when his mother was only 18 and already had two kids. And to make it even worse than that, when he was 4 months old his parents got divorced and his mother was given custody. To get an idea of how bad a neighborhood Wade grew up in, when he was still young, he had already seen bodies in dumpsters and police raids. And to make his situation even worse than that, was the fact that his mother had gotten addicted to and Wade said he even saw his mom take them when he was a kid. And because of this, one of those police raids was in his own home when he was 6 years old. So when Dwayne Wade turned 8, his older sister told him they were going to the movies, but instead took him to go live with his father who lived close by. And a year would pass, and his dad would take Wade and move his new family away from his mother to Robbins, Illinois. 
And once we'd stopped seeing his mom, over the next 10 years, her problems just got much worse and she'd constantly be in and out of jail. But to get away from all the and violence going on, Wade used football and basketball. And he really thanks his older sister for basically raising him and bringing him down the path of sports. And then by the time D Wade got to high school, even though he was a star in football, his true passion was basketball. So in his first two years on the varsity basketball team, he struggled to really get any playing time. But that wasn't until Wade grew four inches in the summer before his junior year and went on to average 20 and 7 as a junior and then 27 and 11 the next year as a senior. But even though he had gotten extremely talented, only three colleges recruited him because his grades were so bad. But one of those ended up being Marquette University. Because of his poor grades though, he had to sit out his freshman year, but did come out as a sophomore and put up 17-6-3, and, and then 21-6-4 and four as a junior, and led his team to the Final Four, where he had really made himself into a star. D Wade's mom declared to change her life and get clean, but when Wade went back to visit her, she confessed that she was heading back to jail for 14 months. But then, Wade would forego his senior season to enter the 2003 NBA Draft. And thankfully, it's said that his mom has been able to stay clean ever since then. Through the help of a few select people, against all odds, Dwayne Wade made it out of a bad neighborhood with a mother who couldn't get her life together, to then making it into the league and helping his mom finally get things right in her life. Number 10, Joel Embiid. Joel grew up in Cameroon, Africa, and his path from there to being one of the NBA's top players is one of the most remarkable you'll see. Because growing up in Africa, he loved the NBA, but he said that he could barely ever watch it because his mom made him focus so much on school that he never had time. In fact, his mom made him stay home and study so much that he never had time to play any sports. But by the time the man was 16, he was 6 foot 10. So because of this, Cameroonian born current NBA player Luke Maba Mute invited him to his basketball camp, where Mbita said that he was so nervous on the first day that he didn't even show up. But the second day, even though he was terrible, his adrenaline took over and he threw down a mean dunk on somebody. And this led to Luke seeing potential in him and brought him to his Basketball Without Borders camp. And then just like that, two months later he was on a plane to go to Florida for high school basketball. And what a huge life change that's gotta be in a three month period. And here's Mr. Steal Your Girl himself in his first year in America. But just as rough as his outfit is, his start to basketball on the court was just as bad. Because he had just started playing a couple of months ago, so he was still terrible at this point. And so bad that his coach kicked him out of the gym on his first day. And all the kids sat there and pointed at him and laughed. So he ran back to his house and cried and started to question why he ever came to America in the first place. But eventually all that doubt fueled him to get better and prove them all wrong. And he did exactly that. He quickly became a 5 star recruit and the buzz really began about him. In just a couple of years he transformed his game from players laughing at him to being one of the best prospects in the country. He'd go on to play at Kansas and even though he got injured would still go 3rd overall in the 2014 NBA draft and has now worked his way up to being one of the best players in the NBA. But no, comment down below if you enjoyed part 1 and part 2. If you did, don't forget to subscribe and I'll catch you next video.